Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Jean. Um, this is a clinical case on dysphagia. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know I usually do my clinical cases on there. But I wanted to do something that was a bit more robust. We could have a bit more of a discussion about certain points in the history. So this case is set in GP. Um, I think GP is a really interesting place to do a clinical case, especially when we're thinking solely about history because they don't have their you know, immediate blood results. They haven't got x-rays. They've not got specialists on call. They really are just using clinical presentation, background um, and history to make a diagnosis. Um, super impressive skills. So we're gonna be GPs today. Um, so our first patient today is Anita Harris and she's 71 years old. We haven't been a good GP and given her a full golden minute to explain her symptoms. So all we know is that she presents with difficulty swallowing. We know that dysphagia equals difficulty swallowing. For us, that's a technical term, but a patient might present and they might say difficulty swallowing and that might mean something different to them than it does to us. They might mean that it's pain. They might mean that there's a lump in the throat. So it's key straight away to define the terms. We need to be on the same page as the patient at this point. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Odynophagia is pain on swallowing and globus is a lump in the throat without dysphagia. And we need to know from the get-go which of these three is the patient talking about because we've got three very different presentations here. If we're talking about pure dysphagia, it's really helpful to know whether the patient is talking high, which we're talking oropharyngeal region of her esophagus, or low, which is a low esophagus. How do we differentiate in the history? We can ask, when is the food getting stuck? Is it getting stuck on it in, when they're initiating that swallow or is it getting stuck immediately after swallowing both of which would indicate high or are we talking about low which would occur a few seconds afterwards um really handy little table here which i thought was useful which i wanted to include which spillets high and low um across the board we can't really use this table completely at the moment because we don't have enough information. We need to know, you know, does this smell like a neuro -y kind of issue or does this sound like a structural compressive sort of thing? We need that to get our proper differential diagnosis. But I thought I've included it here because we can see just by asking those that one question, you know, whereabouts is that? Whereabouts is the issue with the swallow? We're already able to kind of section this in two and we can knock down some differential diagnosis based on this information. So the next thing we're going to come to in the history is what is the duration of this issue? Are we talking years? Are we talking months? Are we talking weeks? So if the patient has something like a food bolus which has been stuck, they're going to give you a clear history of that. They're going to say it occurred after this meal. It's very it's going to be very, very cute. Cancer, we're thinking days to weeks, occasionally to months, but tends to be a bit shorter. And then you might find that you have some chronic motility issues which are going on, you know, into months to years. In terms of solids and liquids, this, again, is a really key question. So it's going to help you separate out um, sort of motility from compressive symptoms. So if the patient says fluids are normal, um, but the problem is with solid foods, you're kind of thinking that this is something that's mechanical. We're talking mechanical obstruction like a stricture, which might be benign. It might be benignant. We don't know at this point. However, if the stricture, for instance, is becoming more severe, then we can progress just from solids to fluids. But they probably would give you a history of saying it started off three weeks ago, four weeks ago as being... Uh, just solids and fluids were fine but now I find that I'm, I'm struggling with fluids as well that would suggest some sort of mechanical obstruction if we were to have something like a motility disorder we would find that the dysphagia is initially more pronounced for fluids than for solids food dysphagia which is solids liquids and saliva would suggest something like a food bolus but could be a stricture or a malignancy that brings us to progressive or intermittent. So if we think about if there's something that's compressing that esophagus, that's not going to really present intermittently because it's there and it's there yesterday, it's there two weeks ago, it's there three weeks ago, it's not going to come and go. And that kind of makes intuitive sense to me at least. Something that's intermittent seems to suggest something that's more characteristic of a motility disorder. It's not there all the time, it's coming and going. So if we have 
you know, if Anita says to us, you know, it's it's got a duration of weeks, it's solids and it's progressive. Already that's given me warning sign. That's given me, that's ringing alarm bells in my head. Uh, we also, to be complete, we want to talk about things like coughing. So are they, are they coughing or sort of spluttering? If you get coughing that occurs immediately after the swallowing, like, like a choking, that's kind of suggesting to you that there's a problem with coordination of swallowing. So you're thinking about things like Parkinson's at this point. If you're getting things like coughing that's occurring significantly after the meal, we could think more about the regurgitation of food, which might be something from a pharyngeal pouch. If you're getting the sense that we're going that way in the history of a pharyngeal pouch, you want to ask about things like halitosis, because that food is lodged in there and it's doing what food does after it's been sat there for a while. So you're going to get that sort of smell and the patient will probably be very embarrassed about that. So it might be something that you've got to ask about yourself. Um, so pharyngeal pouches can also give you gurgling noises. Um, hoarseness might be something you want to think about. So if we've got problems with the recurrent laryngeal nerve, if that's being if that's being compressed, you might get hoarseness. Um, and it's also really important to ask about a history of reflux. So here we're thinking about Barrett's esophagus. Um, I'm not going to go into Barrett's esophagus in this case history, um, but if you're not aware about it, go and read about it. So basically Barrett's esophagus is where you've got reflux. It's changing the cell types in the esophagus. And what you're getting is you're getting an increased risk of cancer. So they, the people that have an identified Barrett's are usually under some sort of monitoring, but you might have a patient that, hasn't been diagnosed or if your patient comes in and has a history of Barrett's again that's a warning sign think about you know bumping your suspicion index up one um so think cancer so what I mean by that basically is check all of your sort of cancer systemic review things has that patient lost weight and do the same with neuro so you want a really thorough neurological history you want a really thorough systems review in your history Okay, so what does Anita say? Anita tells us that this started four weeks ago. She'd never had any problems before four weeks ago. Um, in terms of whether it's solids or liquids, she says it's both recently. It's worse for solids and she can't eat bread at all now. Um, it's definitely worse than it was a week ago, doctor, in terms of it being progressive. So it doesn't, it's not coming and going. It's progressive. It's there all the time and it is worse. She doesn't have any coughing. Um, she denies everything in terms of halitosis, gurgling, voice changes, and she doesn't have a history of reflux. Um, in terms of thinking cancer, thinking neuro, she says she has lost weight over the last few months. She's lost two dress sizes down, but she has been attending Weight Watchers and she's been able to eat less due to the dysphagia. She has no neuro complaints at all. Um, the weight loss thing is really common when you ask patients about weight loss for them to say, Oh, I have lost weight, but, and it's that but that makes you hesitate because they'll say, well, I have lost weight, but actually I've, I've been on a diet. How much is the diet? How much is that a cause for concern? And they might also say, and I've seen this in ED, I can't eat any. So yes, I have lost weight, but I can't eat anything. So I would expect to be able to eat, to lose weight. Um, in terms of her medical history, she's doing well for 71. She just has high blood pressure uh, for which she takes amlodipine. Um, I've included this as a prompt because calcium channel blockers and nitrites can exacerbate reflux. It's not necessarily uh, necessarily relevant to um, Anita, but in terms of thinking about Barrett's esophagus, in terms of thinking of presentations of the throat, you really want to look out for things like calcium channel blockers and nitrites because they might be exacerbating um, presentations. Okay. So we're in GP. She hasn't actually had uh, blood since 2017. Um, so we've got nothing to go from there. There was nothing on those in 2017. She did, like I said, she's doing well for 71, Anita. Uh, we do an exam. So, um, in terms of her general appearance, she looks comfortable at rest. She's well-dressed, alert, no signs of cachexia just on our general inspection. She's not sarcopenic. Uh, she's got good colour, no signs of respiratory distress. Um, we do a full cardiorespiratory examination and there's nothing of note on there. Um, in her abdomen, we've got no signs of organomegaly. We've got nothing uh, significant of note other than there's a well-healed C-section scar. 
Um, in terms of CNS, so we go to do our examination and we note that she is comfortable at rest. She's well dressed, she's alert. There's no cachexia, which is an important thing for us to look at based on the um, findings that we've got because we're probably thinking to rule out cancer as one of our top diagnoses. So it's reassuring to see that she's not cachexic. She's got good colour and there's no signs of respiratory distress. In terms of her cardiorespiratory system, there's nothing of note. Her abdomen is significant only for a well-healed C-section scar. Um, in terms of CNS, we do a really thorough examination, again, based on the history, but we can't find anything of note there either. We do do all of her lymph nodes in her neck and we can find a palpable left supraclavicular node. Um, and in terms of peripheries, there's no swelling, no edema, um, nothing that we can think to note down there. We do a full systems review. Again, it's super relevant in this kind of history that we're checking for everything we can. So with a systems review, you're thinking about things like have they had uh, fainting spells? Um, is there just anything that's not necessarily related to your initial history that might give you an additional flag? Um, if people are interested in what constitutes a systems review, we can go through that in another video. Just comment and let me know and I'll go through it. Um, We've done a full CNS examination, but it's really important to note that we want to do a cranial nerve examination for functional dysphagia. We're checking the neck, neck masses because we want to rule out pharyngeal pouch. Um, and we're looking for things like crest and coilinichia. For those of you who don't know what crest is, so crest is um, another word for the limited cutaneous form of systemic sclerosis. It's also known as LCSSC. And it's a connective tissue disorder. There are five main features of this, which is calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, it's obviously the American spelling, sclerodactyly and telangiectasia. Um, that's what that stands for. It's really, really rare, but if you're thinking about exams, it's something to kind of, you know, note down. Coilinichia is nails that have a spoon shape, so it can be a sign of if her hyperchromic anemia, usually iron deficiency anemia. So at this point, I'd like you to think about what your most likely diagnosis is based on what we've we've gone through. Pause the video and, and have a think. Make notes if you need to. If you're in an OSCE, what is your top differential? If you've got that, think about what could a sensible other differential be. And why do you think that? Which points in the history make you think this smells like this to me. That's what I do. Whenever I read any sort of case study, I'm always kind of thinking to pick up the main points. So I think based on the history, the thing that smacks most would be an esophageal carcinoma. And the things for me that I would pick out in the history that make me concerned about esophageal carcinoma are things like the age of the patient, the fact that it's become progressive, um, if, if this dysphagia was intermittent, that would make me less likely to think there's something compressing. That's not going to come and go. It's there all the time. The fact that it's four solids, um, the fact that she has the weight loss um, and the fact that she's got palpable lymphadenopathy makes me very, very nervous about this patient. So what are we going to do about this lady? You've got her in GP. You've got all of this stuff like palpable lymphadenopathy. Where do we go now? Are we concerned? I would say yes, 100% I'm concerned about this patient and we need to refer this patient immediately to someone in tertiary care, whichever, whatever your, your hospital will have a procedure for this, uh, but they need to be referred in, they need to be seen immediately and they need some investigations. So what type of investigations do we do in dysphagia? What kind of things do we have in our toolbox? So we've got barium swallow. You can also have barium meals and you can have... Um, barium enemas as well i'll go into the difference between those in a minute you've got endoscopies we've got video fluoroscopy and manometry um but these are for different pathologies and dysphagia these are not all for an esophageal carcinoma and we'll go through them in a second you've also got your staging so this is not necessarily for diagnosis of the problem calling dysphagia this is for staging of of a cancer if you find one so you could have ct pet ct uh, PET, endoscopic ultrasound, oloproscopy. So we're going to refer to the MDT, we've done that. What they will do is they need to assess whether the patient's fit for surgery and that, that decision will constitute um, all of the information that you have. So how fit the patient is, 
how advanced the cancer is, what type of cancer it is, if it is cancer, has it spread. Um, if they are fit, you might want to do a esophagectomy and you can offer neoadjuvant chemo or endoscopic mucosal or resection. Again, all of these kind of depend on what type of cancer it is, how, um, how advanced it is and um, whether the patient is even fit for surgery. You might find in a lot of these patients that they're not fit. So achalasia is a failure of smooth muscle fibres. So what you basically get is you get incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter and you get lack of paracelsis and that's the movement of the esophagus to kind of push things down. Um, you get a failure of this, so you get difficulty swallowing, you can get regurgitation and you can also get chest pain. Um, in terms of kind of the factors that we've been looking at throughout this case study, you're going to get intermittent symptoms. This isn't compressive. It's not like there's a cancer. It's going to come and go and it's going to be for both solids and fluids. Um, in, in diagnosing this, we want barium studies and we want manometry. So treatment for achalasia can be a, a variety of things. You would want to start with lifestyle changes. So eating slowly, that sort of thing, avoiding meals near bedtime. Um, there are drugs that you can use. Um, I'm not going to go into those in this video because this is obviously a case study. So we're just going to mainly focus on esophageal cancer. Um, but there's a variety of things you can do. Think you can have um, surgery. There's something called helomyotomy, which you might want to go and read about. Um, so Plummer Vinson. So Plummer Vinson syndrome is something that you're probably never going to come across in real life. Um, but it is something that they could potentially pop up on some obscure exam somewhere. So it's really rare and it's a disease that is characterised by, a, again, difficulty swallowing, obviously, iron deficiency anemia, glossitis, esophageal webs. You treat it with iron supplementation. In terms of, again, the things that we've been looking at, we're looking at it's painless, it's going to be intermittent. We're looking at solids progressing to liquids. Pharyngeal pouch, this is this is a bulge that develops in the esophagus. So it usually happens to older people. And it, you're going to have difficulty swallowing again, obviously. Um, but you're also going to feel like there's a lump in your throat. So that's a really key thing to ask the patient. And they're going to bring up, they're going to regurgitate that food and they might as well have bad breath. And the reason they have bad breath is because it's kind of sitting there. Um, so they may well have a chronic cough. So that's something to ask about. And they might be aspirating that food Um which is a bit of a concern, especially if they're older, you might see weight loss. And the way to diagnose that is via barium studies. We just go back to our investigations just to finish. Barium studies use a series of x-rays to have a look at the, um, at the GI tract. What happens is that the patient drinks a contrast medium, which shows up on x-ray and allows us to see things like the patency of the esophagus. There are a couple of different options in terms of barium studies. So you can have a barium swallow, which looks at the pharynx and the, the top of the esophagus. You can have a barium meal, which is looking at lower part. The theme is here as they, they move down. So it's looking at the stomach and the duodenum. The follow through looks at the small intestine and the barium en enema looks at the large intestine and the rectum. Endoscopy is obviously the camera down the throat. You're probably quite familiar with that. Um, video fluoroscopy. It's similar to the barium studies in that you're visualising the functional movement of the organs. Manometry is a little bit different. So manometry is where you are having a small catheter that is guided into the esophagus. And that catheter is connected to a computer which measures the pressure of the swallow. Manometry is a little bit different. So manometry is where the um, patient has a small um, catheter guided into the esophagus. And this catheter is connected to a computer, which measures the pressure of the esophageal contractions. This is something that we might use to diagnose achalasia or diffuse esophageal spasm or something like scleroderma. So thank you everyone for watching this video. Um, this is my first my clinical case studies series. So um, I'm hoping to improve. If you have any comments, things you liked, things you'd like me to include, please let me know. You can follow me or contact me on Instagram at the surgical doctor if you like, or you can contact me on the comments of this video. Um, thank you very much. Please subscribe for more videos. Take care. Have a lovely day.